Okay, so uh, yeah, let's go through the exam. And uh, if you have any questions on how your exam was graded or anything like that, I'd be happy to talk about it. Let's try to get it taken care of in the next you know, couple days or whatever. I, it's kind of hard to talk about a test. Like sometimes at the end of the semester, people start to see like what kind of grades they need to get whatever. And so then they come talk to me about exam one or whatever. Let's, if you have any questions, let's just do it as soon as possible. Um, so exam one. Uh, number one. So we got this piston cylinder system. Uh, it's acted upon by a 1,000 Newton force as it goes through this process. Okay, so um, what you need to see uh, in that sentence is that over the whole process, there's a single external force pushing on the other side of this piston, and, and you want that to register like this is going to be a constant pressure. Okay. So, um, based on that, if I draw a free body diagram of the piston, the forces that are acting on it are a 1,000 Newton force, like this, and then the atmospheric pressure times the cross-sectional area of that piston pushing down. Um, the atmospheric pressure is 1 times 10 to the fifth. But like if you're doing a free body diagram, these are all forces. This isn't a force yet, so we have to multiply it by uh, 0.1 is the area. And then on the other side is the pressure of the gas times that same cross-sectional area. And so Newton's second law um, says that... Uh, 1,000 uh, plus 10,000, that's the point 1 times uh, 1 times 10 to the fifth, is equal to point 0.1p. And so p is equal to 1.1 1 .1 times 10 to the fifth pascals. By the way, uh, that's only necessarily true if this thing happens as a quasi-equilibrium uh, process. So, um, you know, basically assuming that this process happens slowly, so at every instant it's reasonable to treat it like it's an equilibrium. Okay. Um, So now that we have the pressure, so that's part A. And then for part B, what's the work of the gas? Well, uh, the key to being able to do part B is recognizing that the pressure is constant. So for constant pressure, the work of expansion is equal to, well, it's always equal to um, PdV. But the thing that you have for constant pressure is that this is equal to, you can pull the constant pressure out of the integral and you just get this. Um, and then that just comes out to be pressure times the change in volume. So this is equal to 1.1 times 10 to the fifth times uh, the volume goes from, it goes 2.02 .02 from 0 0.05. And so you get a value of um, negative 3,300 joules. Um, and then for part C, uh, we were assuming that um, 
the change in E is just equal to the change in internal energy. Um, so the first law says the change in U is equal to uh, Q minus W. Oh, well, yeah, you don't have to do this. Um, it says that we're, that if the change in energy is zero, okay, so forget this thing. This is just equal to zero. So we just have this. And so uh, Q is equal to W. And so uh, Q is equal to negative 3,300 joules. <clears throat> and then the last part of the question is, does that mean that heat leaves the system or enters the system? Uh, positive Q means heat is added to the system, so energy is leaving the system through heat. Any questions about that one? Okay, so for number two, um, we have an expansion uh, at state one. Um, we have a pressure of five times 10 to the fifth in SI units and a volume of 0.4. And then in, on, at state two, we have a pressure of two megapascals. So this pressure goes way up two times 10 to the six. We don't know what V2 is. <coughs> Um, and so we are going to use the fact that, so for part A, we want to calculate the volume at state two. Um, we're going to use the fact that pressure times volume to the power of 1.3 is equal to some constant. Uh, so the first thing we have to do is calculate the value of C. Um, so we will say, uh, okay, so from state one, the pressure is five times 10 to the fifth, and that's multiplied by 0.4, to the power of 1.3, and that's equal to C, which comes out to be uh, 151,932 in SI units. And so now we'll go to state two, And we know that the pressure is 2 times 10 to the 6. Uh, we're trying to calculate this volume. So 2 times 10 to the 6 times the volume to the power of 1.3 is equal to 151,932. And so uh, the volume to the power of 1.3 is equal to divide both sides by 2 times 10 to the 6. And, well, I, I don't know what that is because I did a little differently. Um, but now we can take both sides. Um, we're trying to come up with 
v to the power of 1. So we're going to take both sides to the power of um, negative 1.3. So this is equal to 151, 932, divided by 2 times 10 to the 6, all to the power of negative 1. Point, no, reciprocal, sorry, uh, times 1 over 1.3. Because, so the reason we're doing this is that uh, V to the 1.3, <clears throat> all to the power of 1 over 1.3 is equal to V to the 1. That's what we want. Mm -hmm. uh, so this comes out to be V is 0 0.138. Um, okay, so that's the volume at state 2. Um, and then we want to calculate uh, the work for the gas. Well, in order to calculate the work, so that was uh, part A. For part B, so let's talk about how to recognize what to do here. Um, notice that whenever you have this relationship between pressure and volume, you can write pressure as a function of volume. And writing pressure as a function of volume is what you need in order to calculate that work of expansion. Okay, so that's what you want to have kind of occurring to you, you know, like, oh, this is going to give me a chance to represent pressure as a function of volume, which will let me calculate that integral. And now we have the volumes at the two states, too. So we have everything we need to calculate that integral. Um, first, we have to rearrange this to express pressure as a function of volume. So we know that PV to the 1.3 is equal to 151,932. Uh, And um, so uh, now we want to multiply both sides by V to the negative 1.3. So pressure as a function of volume is equal to 151,932 times V to the negative 1.3. This is kind of a, a exponent rule workout. Um, but now that we have this, we can write the work is equal to the integral from the starting pressure, uh, from the starting volume, sorry, 0.4 to the ending volume, 0.138 of pressure dV. So this is 151,932 V to the negative 1.3 dV, and we can pull out the constant 151,932 times the integral of V to the negative 1.3 dV, and now if you integrate this, you get 151,932 uh, use the exponent integral rule. So this is uh, V, add 1 to negative 1.3, so V to the power of negative 0 0.3, divided by negative 0 0.3, evaluated from volume of 0.4 to volume of 0.138. And if you calculate all that, you get work of negative 250, 743 joules. And then the last question is, um, does the sign make sense uh, for the work? 
Well, in order to understand that, to answer that, you have to look at the volumes. Um, this thing goes from a volume of 0.4 to a volume of 0.138, so it's compressed. And so work needs to be negative. Any questions about that? So on these kind of things, uh, one mistake that's easy to make is to not represent pressure as a function of volume before you go to this integral. You're always going to end up with a negative of your starting exponent if it's given in this form like this, pressure times volume is equal to a constant. Okay, so just remind yourself what that integral is and then fit what you have into that. And then the third one, Uh, okay, we have a closed tank. And that means that the volume is not going to change. So the volume is constant. Um, work is done through electricity to the system. Uh, so W dot is equal to, you have to use the fact that work is being done on the system to think about the sign. Um, w and W dot are positive in the first law if the system is doing work on the surroundings. This is the opposite of that. So this is going to be negative 1,000. Uh, heat transfer from the gas to the surroundings it gives that rate. Well, Q and Q dot are positive if heat is being added to the system. Uh, this is the opposite of that. So Q dot is going to be negative 0 0.01 T squared. Um, and so now we can go to the first law, the differential first law, that says DE dt is equal to negative 0.01 t squared minus a negative 1,000. So DE dt, you can write as 1,000 minus 0.01 t squared. Uh, I told you that, um, I hope I did, I think I did, tell you that we're going to assume that this is just equal to du dt. Is that right? You have that written on your test somewhere? Yeah, you wrote On the board, okay. Um, and so we have du dt is equal to 1,000 minus 0 0.01 t squared. And so that's your answer for the rate of change of internal energy. And then to calculate the change in internal energy, you just have to integrate this. So um, you can think of this as a separation of variables. Like this is kind of a simple differential equation. Uh, we have du is equal to 1,000 minus 0.01 t squared dt, bless you. And now we can integrate both of these from state 1 to state 2. So you can think of this as from u1 to u2. You can think of this one as uh, You can think of, at the start of this process, you can think of, let's call the time zero at the start of this process. You don't have to do that, but it'll sort of simplify what this looks like. Um, so we're going from time zero to time t. 
the integral on the left becomes the change in internal energy, and the one on the right becomes 1000 T minus 0.003 repeating T cubed. Any questions about that? So this is the answer to C. Um, I think, you know, I've said before that this class is sort of this, you, all these equations are thrown at you, all these facts are thrown at you, and really what you're trying to do is be aware of what the clues are telling you as they're dropped in these problems and have those clues make you think of certain equations and certain, so, um, yeah. So, uh, I think the important stuff that, like, as I look at this, uh, just pops into my head, and I think, like, okay, I'm gonna use this on this problem. Um, for number one, right away when you see that you have that constant force applied to the top of the piston, um, that tells you that this is constant pressure. And the rest of the problem all comes from recognizing that that's constant pressure. Um, for the second one, we have a relationship between pressure and volume. And that tells you, okay, I can represent pressure as a function of volume. And so if work comes up in this problem, I can do that integral. In general, you can't do that integral. Like if, you, if you're not given any information about the relationship between those two. But if you're given that relationship at the start of the problem, you wanna think like, okay, I'm probably gonna end up doing this integral. And then for the third one, uh, I don't know, that's largely just recognizing that we're talking about rates, I think. Um, so knowing that you're gonna have to use the differential first law, and then just dealing with the sign convention. Okay, any final questions on that? Um, yeah. yeah. I was just about to ask, we do uh, conservation of mass number four. If, oh, there's a number four? No, the conservation mass number four. Like, really oh, 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 homework problem. Okay. <laughs> okay. Uh, I did have yes. a, just a quick comment. Yeah. If, so if work expansion is a P of V dV, why, isn't it, why don't we write P of V to better emphasize a P as a function of V in that equation? Because this is just a more common way that you're given a relationship between those two. That's all. Got it. So you just have to remember it's P of V and not just P dV. Oh, uh, well, no, it is just P dV. You're right, it is just P dV. The problem is in order to do that integral in terms of the independent variable V, you have to come up with P as a function of V. Got it. So when I write it in that function form, I'm just trying to be explicit about that. Okay, uh, yes, we can do conservation of mass number four. So the cylindrical tank one? Yep. Okay. So cross-sectional area of one meter squared. Nope. 
Okay, so this area is one meter squared. Um, and it's being drained through a duct on, duct on the bottom with a cross-sectional area of 3 times 10 to the minus 4. So there's some kind of spigot coming out here, and this thing has an area of 3 times 10 to the minus 4 meters squared. Um, so what things are occurring to me at this point? Um, if you're given the, the area, the cross-sectional area of an inlet or an exit, it's very likely that you're heading towards using this equation that says the rate of mass flow, in this case at the exit, is equal to the area times the average speed divided by the specific volume. So I'm expecting this problem to say something about, you know, to have something about the speed of the water coming out or something. Uh, and then there it is in the next thing, the velocity of the water uh, is, so if I think of the water in here, So there's the water in the tank, and this is the height of the water, Z. Okay, the speed at the exit is equal to 2GZ square root um, also uh, for liquid water, um, it's almost completely incompressible. So uh, we often just estimate the specific volume as 0 0.001 uh, meters cubed per kilogram. <clears throat> we also, if we want to be more precise, um, for liquid water, uh, we could, so, we could look at a saturated liquid water in the table at the temperature that we're dealing with. Does it say a temperature? I don't think it does. Um, so you could be more, a little more precise if it gives a temperature. You could look in the table for saturated liquid water. Saturated, not because this is saturated, but just because that specific volume only varies with the temperature and find saturation at the temperature that you're at and use that specific volume. It doesn't make much of a difference though, but a little bit of a difference. Okay, so uh, velocity at the exit is this, depending on Z, uh, the water level in meters. It initially contains 2,500 kilograms of liquid water. Okay, so um, if it initially contains that mass of water, okay, and we know the density of water, and we know the cross-sectional area, we can come up with a relationship between the mass of water in there and Z. So we're sort of heading towards doing these calculations as a function of that height Z. Mm -hmm. Okay, so um, let's do that. On pen. Ooh, came back. Okay, so uh, what did I say? Twenty five hundred initially. Uh, so the initial mass, I'll call it M one, is equal to the density of water times the volume. which is the density times the area times Z, and that's equal to 1,000 times 1 times Z. So M1 is equal to 1,000 Z. Um, 
density of the water, how long will it take until the tank contains 900 kilograms of water? Okay, so 900 kilograms, that's the end of our process. Uh, oh, this was equal to 2,500. I didn't use that. So um, Z at the start is equal to uh, 2.5, 2.5 uh, yeah, that's in meters. Okay. And then uh, M2 at the end of this process is 900 kilograms. And that's equal to this again, so 1,000 Z. And so Z2 is equal to 0 0.9 meters. Um, and now we can use what we know about the speed. Um, so the mass flow rate at the exit is equal to the area of the exit. So 3 times 10 to the minus 4th. times the speed, which is square root of 2gz. Divided by the specific volume of the water. Well, the problem gives us a density, so we just take the reciprocal of that, and it's 0 0.001. And uh, let's see. Can someone multiply 3 times 10 to the minus 4th times the square root of 20, I guess? Square root of 19.62. 0 0.001322. 0.001322. Times z to the one half over point zero zero one, and so this is one point three three z to the one half. Um, there's no inlet, and so conservation of mass says. Uh, does it say steady state? Oh well, we know it's not steady state. The what's inside is changing. So dm dt in the control volume is equal to m at the inlet dot minus m at the exit dot. This is zero. So dm dt for the control volume is equal to negative 1.33 z to the 0.5. Um, and we want to calculate Oh, right. So um, that, yes. Uh, so we have this relationship between mass and Z. So um, we can write this as D, D, T. of, yeah, let's see. So we know that mass as a function of z is equal to 1,000 z. So um, 
dm dt is 1000 z dot. And so now we can, well, I guess I'll go back up to this one. Uh, and we have, so 1000, I'll write z dot as dz dt is equal to negative 1.33 z to the one half. And now I'll write this as, uh, what's 1,000 divided by 1 1.33? 750, let's call it 752. I've already done some rounding and stuff. Um, so 752 times z to the negative 0.5 dz is equal to dt, and now we can integrate this. The time will go from zero time to t. z, we know the starting and ending heights, uh, so we're going from 2.5 to 0.9. Integrate the left side and you get uh, 752z to the 0.5 divided by 2, which is uh, 1,504. Evaluated from 2.5 to 0.9 is equal to t. And so we have 1504 times the square root of 0.9 minus 1504 times the square root of 2.5 is equal to t. Um, and, oh, I lost a negative sign. Uh, so this would be negative, this is negative, this is negative, this is positive. Can someone calculate that number for me? What is it? Oh, okay. Nine fifty one point two yeah. seconds, and that's the elapsed time. Okay, so that was sort of scattered because I was trying to work my way through it. But uh, anybody have any questions about the flow? I think, like, really, one of the biggest keys to this stuff is recognizing clues when they're given to you. We were given the area of that spigot. We were given the speed coming out. I'm like, okay, we're gonna use that somehow to calculate the rate of flow out of that thing. And pretty immediately that came up, you know. Uh, then the fact that we were given the cross-sectional area of this tank and we're doing stuff in terms of the height I'm thinking cross-sectional area times the height is the volume. So that's going to come up somehow. And we related that to the mass. And then uh, the trickiest step for sure was this one that I uh, didn't see for a second. Uh, since we have mass as a function of the height of the water, um, we can write the time derivative of the mass as a function of z, you know? Mm -hmm. and, and then you have this differential equation where, you know, your independent variable is time, your dependent variable is z. Um, 
that step is is tricky, but um, I've talked to a couple people recently and said this about this class. Like, I don't think this is as as critical for statics. Statics, everything sort of keeps building on itself and you don't have many equations. You're just kind of trying to learn processes that work for everything. But in thermo, I really think it's important that you keep going back to your notes and reading and rereading your notes, you know? Um, that's how you're gonna spot these clues. Uh, and really, like, if you can get to the point where you remember all of the key equations, you know? That, I mean, easier said than done, but if you can get to that point, or even, you know, another thing that I think might be a good idea is just do this stuff with a sheet of all the equations written in front of you, you know? Uh, the next thing I'm gonna do, is it, is it right now? Where'd my stupid notes go? Oh no, so we're still finishing up uh, those five devices. But after that, I'm gonna go through a detailed uh, outline, which I've done a couple times so far, where I'm listing out all the equations that I think you should remember. and. And if you can get to the point where you, re where you could sort of give an outline like this with those key equations written in, you'll find it so much easier to just have your brain jump around what you need to to solve problems like this. Okay, it really, that's a technique that works for any class where you're just given like, they throw a ton of equations, a ton of techniques at you. When you take differential equations, for example, the same the same approach will work well, I think. And all these equations are just being derived from the fact that matter, matter can neither be created nor destroyed. So essentially, the net of any system you look at is zero, right? Well, yeah, those you're right about those process equations, but like as far as like some of these things, they're coming from all sorts of different places. The fact that uh, that you can calculate the time rate of mass flow in or out uh, as the area times the speed divided by specific volume. That wouldn't just pop into your head. You don't want to be deriving stuff like that. You're just going to have to remember that you have that stuff. And you don't have to remember the equations, but you have to remember vaguely what they, what they relate to each other, you know. Any other questions? Okay, well, uh, let's stop. Uh, and so next time I'll do compressors and pumps and then we'll get into that big outline.